All right, good stuff. Um, anyways, my name's Chris. I uh, do the mentoring over at FX Groundworks with Derek. And uh, if uh, you've heard of harmonic patterns before, you probably uh, you probably heard of us. Um, so I don't know how many of you guys have traded harmonics at some point. I know that Derek's done a, a session. I believe it was last month. Um, I wasn't able to attend it with him, but uh, yeah, I'll try and do that, boy. Uh, let me see here. Where's the volume settings? The the session that uh, we normally do is just kind of going over a lot of the basics, but I didn't know how many of you guys uh, trade the pattern so that I kind of have an idea of um, of what you guys might know about harmonics or what you might not, but uh, essentially they are patterns that are traded on uh, repetitive human emotions, right? And that's what, uh, that's what, um, I would say uh, the majority of, of what we do is. Uh, in fact, it's all I do. I know that Derek uh, kind of looks at some of the more fundamental stuff that goes on, but mainly I, I focus on price action of these patterns. So we can definitely go over a lot of them in, in a few setups for you guys today and, and kind of get you teaching and, and knowing about it. We do have a harmonic uh, cheat sheet, which is all about these patterns. You can get it. Um, off fxgroundworks.com so if you just want to download I, it's totally up to you if you want to get the magazines there's three issues that are kind of packed with about 72 different articles um, and issue one on the back page has the harmonic uh, pattern cheat sheet and you can kind of wrap go along but uh, these patterns are I imagine most of you have traded fibs before um, these patterns are uh, let's just say a, a collection of fib clusters, we'll call them, and uh, it gives us a moment of high probability reversal. So they are reversal patterns. Uh, yeah, I'll get the link for you. Uh, and they are not um, uh, continuation sort of patterns. They're not going to be uh, breakouts. So if you trade breakouts, that's not really what we're doing. We're looking for uh, reversal patterns. Uh, let me just get the link for you. If you want to, here, I'll give you my email as well. If you'd rather just send me a direct email, I can always send you a copy too after today's session, or you can grab it from the link above. Um, so what we what we essentially want to be looking at are uh, where these fib clusters come together um, with these harmonic patterns. Now, I don't want to make this sound difficult because it's really not. Um, but there are a collection of fib measurements um, that allow you to uh, experience that moment of high probability where they all basically come together. And I imagine if you've traded any more than, uh, I would say, five minutes, you've probably understood that uh, these patterns, or fibs at least, um, have a significant role in, in price action if you are trading back. Uh, let me just see if I can fix that. Yeah, I don't. Is there a setting in in uh, WebEx that stops it from fading in and out? Is that something that uh, I, I guess I I don't know if that's something that um, can be changed in in WebEx. Anyway, um, hopefully that. Uh, that sound won't be a, an issue. Let me just have a quick look here. Yeah, it seems like it's uh, it fluctuates. Huh? I'll try and keep an eye on it. Yeah, no, basically everything's shut down on my end. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll have to figure it out. I guess maybe later is it too bad where we don't want to continue or i don't know why it's auto adjusting let me see here Well, 
hopefully um I, I tried changing one setting here and, and and hopefully that will keep things going i don't know all right um so the the patterns that we were looking at are going to be reversal patterns and what we call this collection of fibs is our prz or the potential reversal zone um, this is going to be the area that we actually want to get into the trade and if you look at any of the patterns they kind of look like w's or m's and that point where the pattern finishes is where we we want to get in um, we have target markings that our indicator kind of paints out for us um, so that's going to be something that uh, you, you might want to have a look at as potential areas for targets. There are a lot of different ways that people take targets, and we could probably spend a whole webinar on how to take targets with harmonic patterns to maximize your results. And, you know, perhaps that's something that we can schedule with the FX3 um, next month. Uh, but I think the uh, the best thing that we could probably do today is spend our time on is just get you guys familiar with these patterns so that we can actually go ahead and uh, take a few. So if you look at um, a lot of the, the patterns that are drawn on here, and I'll bring up a, you know some other ones, and we do have some that aren't completed yet, and we have others that are forming um, that we were looking at earlier in our session today. But you can see a lot of these patterns are going to be uh, patterns that uh, probably, uh, I guess the best way to describe them is the, the bigger the pattern is, the better in a way. So we, we want to focus on trying to find patterns that have a very large amount of bars between the start of the pattern and the end of the pattern. So this would be a bullish pattern, for example. And bullish patterns, obviously, we know that because they look like Ms. If you want to see a pattern that looks like a W, uh, it's going to be a bearish pattern. So what we do is we just color code our indicators here so that the bullish ones are blue, and you'll always see the bearish ones as being red. Um, so that's kind of like just a, a quick and dirty way of kind of telling that. But we have two categories of patterns. So we have um, basically we have retracement patterns, meaning that the entry point is going to be lower than what the start of the pattern is. And then we also have extension patterns, meaning that the, the pattern itself is going to look um, like the the final point of reversal has extended and it's going to be beyond the start of the pattern. So when we have extension patterns or when we have retracement patterns, each one of them has a lot of different pros and cons to them. A lot of extension patterns can have higher risk versus rewards, meaning if you wanted to risk, say, 20 pips, you could make 40, um, where a lot of the retracement patterns might have a smaller, you know, you might be risking 10 only to make 10. Um, but there's all sorts of different patterns like this that will occur in the market every day. And we scan about 1,200 of them um, to kind of filter them down to get the best sort of highest probability ones. Now, there are ways you can do this yourself. For example, um, one of the easiest ways to kind of get to, to know what a better pattern is over another pattern would be to make sure it's at least 30 bars. And the reason why we, we say 30 bars, the actual number is 29.7, I believe. Um, that's how many bars we need in a pattern before that probability will switch. So that's um, based off the 1.3 million patterns that we scanned in our database now. And that 29.7 is going to be what the minimum would be. Now, if we have that as a minimum, um, the 20 or the 30 bars, I should say, then we know that the structure of the pattern or the integrity of the pattern is going to be a lot better than if you look at patterns that are only made up of, let's just say, 10 bars. Okay, so if, if you look at these patterns, if you're finding these patterns based off the, the fib ratios in that cheat sheet, then you'll be able to identify, after you've identified the pattern, how many bars are going to be from the start of the pattern to the end of the pattern. So how do you go about finding these patterns? Um, if you wanted to do it manually, it's very, um, I guess, easy after you've had some practice. It can be difficult at the start. Um, but essentially what you want to do is you want to look for any major high or low in the market, and that will usually give you a good way of trying to find the patterns or the biggest patterns, the best patterns. And a, a shortcut you could use is if you see any Ms or Ws, you might be able to 
shortcut your way into getting a pattern. So for example, um, you could be looking at a pattern. If we want to look at any highs or lows in the market that might have occurred, uh, let's just say up here, this would be a high, right? And um, I guess that's not showing up well. Let me just change this and we'll fill it in, right? So this could be a, a potential start of a pattern. Any high or low in the market could be a start. We don't know if it's going to actually become a pattern until we measure out all the fib ratios. So this is the, the more boring stuff, but it does help you find the patterns, which then get you the probability. Um, so if you wanted to look at other highs or lows in the market, let me just move some data in here. Uh, we can look at, uh, these are potential highs or lows, right? And this is the, like I said, the easiest way to kind of go about it. Um, but any higher low in the market could essentially be an X point, such as this one. Um, we could have a X point that's right here, right? So this would be the start of a pattern as well. Um, now, the, the next thing you have to do is you have to figure out a move up or down from that pattern. If I'm moving down, we know that we're going to be creating a bearish pattern because this pattern is going to look more like a W and an extension pattern than it would to be looking at it the other way around where we're looking for a bearish move because the price is not heading down, it's actually gonna be heading up. So if we mapped out what we thought our pattern would look like, we might map out something that looked like this, right? This might be a, a nice little pattern here that could turn in to be a, a crab pattern, right? And we're gonna go all the way up to the high because that's where price is reversed. I don't know if this, would have actually have been a pattern, but we'll we'll find out and kind of walk through it together. So did you guys download that cheat sheet? Because if you did, what you should be looking for is a bearish crab pattern. And you'll start to see the ratios and you'll get, get familiar with them. And there's a whole bunch of shortcuts you can kind of do with them because a lot of the ratios are the same uh, between each of the patterns. So the first thing that you have to do to find out where that cluster of fibs is, um, to find that end point the one that you want to kind of get in at is going to measure between the what we call the x point and that's the start of the pattern all the way down to the bottom right so that's going to give us our, our first sort of uh, emotional drive of the pattern going from x to the start of our a point and the reason why it's lettered x a b c and d is because it's it's actually on um, blackout on the last page of the Harmonic Magazine, issue number one. So you can just go to fxgroundworks.com. There should be a link above, and you can download it that way. Um, but if you if you look at the A, B, C, D part, you can get from like an A, B equals C, D pattern in it. Um, sometimes, obviously, with these extension patterns, they can go way beyond. But the idea here is that you have an emotional drive before your A, B equals C, D pattern. And then we have different... Um, sort of harmonic patterns that we can join together and find our fibs. So you'll notice that with the crab pattern, uh, the XA gives us a 1618 extension all the way up to this level here. Okay, so I'm going to change this to uh, probably red, might stand out a bit better. Sorry, one sec. It probably disappeared up the, the chat too far. Or if you just go to Google and type in Harmonic Mag, you'll find it. There you go. Anyways, um, so the 1618 is going to be where the start of that fib cluster is. And that's going to measure uh, going from X to A. And that's where you're going to get that first number. So if you look at the cheat sheet, it's going to have the 1618 for the bearish crab pattern. And that's the first ratio we found. So that's going from our X to our A. And we're mapping in um, our extension. The other level that you'll see is that the B point, which is a center point right here, it's kind of like the heart of the pattern. It's going to have to be between a 618 and a 382. So if you look over here, it's kind of small, but you'll see the, the 618 and then the 382 is all the way down here. So as long as price comes up to that point, we know that we're good to go, right? So as long as we have the X to the A and the B point, that's where we want to get going. So we know that the B point's valid. And we also know that we have an extension to a 1618. Um, there's only two other ratios that we actually have to measure. So, son, 
too difficult. If you've used fibs before, this is going to be like sec second nature to you. Um, but I'm going to draw from our B point. And a lot of people mess this up. They usually go from their, their C point to their B point. You want to go from your B point all the way down to your C point. And you're going to be looking for a 2618 to a 3618. And I don't think I did two. There we go. Okay, our 3618 is going to be right where our 1618 was. So it's almost going to be right on top of it. And then the 2618 is going to be much lower. It's going to be all the way down here. Right, so if you were to map in where these fibs were, where this pattern was, you're going to be looking at a potential reversal area that's going to happen uh, in this area right here. Okay, now one thing you'll notice with harmonics, if you guys traded them for a little while, um, is you can use them with a lot of other different systems. So if you wanted to um, use them, oh, thanks, Black Hat. If you, if you want to use them as a, uh, as a way to pinpoint reversals if you're trend trading or if you are, um, if you are, uh, whatchamacallit, um, using it in any other sort of, I mean, however you want to do it. If you want to use it as, uh, you know, if you, if you trade ranges or whatnot, um, you can use these PRZs to line up any sort of area that you're already thinking that a reversal might happen. Um, and when you use areas like support resistance, either in trends or outside of trends and ranges, you can really improve their accuracy a lot, um, especially it helps with stop placement. Right, so if you look at stop placement and where you want to put your stop, where you want to get and where you don't, um, that would be where you know support, resistance, channels, trends, all that stuff can really help you out. One of the things that we do after we map out the pattern is we always want to figure out what our risk versus reward is. Okay, so to give you an idea on this pattern, um, let me see here. On this pattern, that would have happened where it wouldn't have been up that high. It really would have been a lot lower. Uh, it was giving us a, a base square 3618 and our 1618, which we had to meet as a minimum, is going to be all the way up, probably closer to that 153 area, right? So if we were getting in all the way up here where we had most of our fibs, then where would you want to put your stop? Right? That would be your, your next obvious sort of question. Our stop is going to have to be uh, basically on the other side of the PRZ. But how far out you go is going to depend if you use anything like support resistance channels, that sort of thing. So if you want to put your stop, um, let's just say you want to put your stop maybe about 40 pips higher, you'll have to make sure that you're going to have at least 80 pips to your first target. And your first target should be this B point or before. Right, so if you had a B point that um, was 80 pips lower, and we'll we'll just measure it out here, so you can see that we're about 83 pips. If you had a B a B point that was uh, double of what your stop was, then that would be sort of like a qualifying sort of answer to get into that trade. Right, so in this case, if we had entered in at somewhere around 152.98, you would put a stop. Uh, about 32 pips higher, let's just say, um, you would need at least 64 pips uh, before your first target. So that would give you at least a two to one risk versus reward. Now, if you have a two to one risk versus reward and you can maintain that two to one, so that's your average, you're always going to win twice as much as what you lose, then you only need to be right a third of the time, right? 33%. And that will get you to a break even point. So if you believe that the patterns can be more than 33% correct for two to one risk versus award, then that's when your account is gonna start growing and increasing. So the, the idea would be is to only take trades where, or harmonic trades, where that risk versus award is gonna work out, right? So that's one of the ways that you can kind of filter them out. So when we have 1200 patterns that we alert to each and every day, and we wanna filter out all the ones that don't meet a minimum risk versus award of two to one, we're probably going to filter out a good eight, 900 patterns because a lot of them will not meet that criteria. Oh, I just realized I was sending that link to, uh, to the FX administrator instead of publicly. Sorry guys. That's probably why you didn't see that, that link I posted earlier. Anyways, um, Black Hat, thanks for posting that. 
So um, what you want to do, of course, now is after you filtered out um, the the risk versus reward and, and you figured out that that pattern is there and you have that risk versus reward is you can definitely go ahead and, and you know, place your trade. One of the things that we look at um, in Groundwork, so is the structure range. So we rank every single pattern based off uh, about 28 different factors. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, and you can do this all all manually, but um, like looking for the 30 bars and whatnot. Uh, this is what you'll see in our uh, sort of members area. And you can see how I filter out my risk versus reward. You can set a minimum maximum value. But what I want to do is just change uh, the structure rating or I'll remove it just so you guys can get an idea of how many um, patterns actually get formed that might not meet a minimum risk versus reward uh, so that you can kind of see them. Uh, I'm going to set this. Sorry, I'm just going to change everything on you so that you can see what I'm getting at. Oh, let me log back in. And I'm going to change these risk versus reward parameters, and I'm going to change my structure. So when you look for harmonic trades, you really should be looking for um, patterns that at least meet some sort of criteria. So you can see, for instance, uh, this one has a 15% structure rating. So the chance of this working out where you have your enter between your current price, and you can even add in uh, the targets if you want to see where your B point was in your stop price. There we go. So um, you can kind of see where those targets are and uh, what the risk versus reward is. So this is 1.71 to 1. And so that means you're, for every pip you're risking, you're going to make 1.71 if you hit your first target. Um, and you can see how many are, let's just say, below that that 15% or even below what, what we use as a minimum is 70. So we want to get above... 70% and not anything below it. So you can see most of the patterns, in fact, lie below. And that's why a lot of people, when they start off um, with harmonics and they, they want to, um, you know, kind of increase their odds and probability, they'll start using the patterns, but they might not get the results that they're hoping for. And the structure has a lot to do with the pattern. So how big the pattern is, uh, you know, different angles um, that the X point. So for instance, just going back here to... Uh, to our charts, the X point to the D point and the C to the D, they have a big impact um, depending on how steep their angles are. Depends on how much price is likely to fluctuate within the PRC. So we can look for patterns that have big emotional drives to look for a, uh, like if you, if you follow GAN theory at all, you'll know that um, anything that has a price greater than a 45 degree angle has a greater chance of falling back than to continue on. So if it's less than 45 degrees, we know that there's a higher probability that price could go through the PRZ. So when we look for our patterns, that's some of the things that we want to look for. Um, but that's what kind of builds up and makes up our structure rating. Does that make sense? Are you guys kind of on the same path? You guys have any questions at all? It all kind of makes sense. So one of the, the patterns that, uh, for instance, we were looking at earlier today um, was one that happened after NFP. So you can see last Friday, we had the NFP results come out. And uh, see by the large candlestick what happened, but it created a nice little crab pattern up here where you could be looking at a point of reversal um, for this crab pattern right at the very top, just around that 119 area. And you can go ahead and map out the ratios if you want to see exactly where those lines were. Um, but this sort of thing has projected a reversal and our B point and our, our target is saying that we can come all the way down to about 117. Um, before we surpass, let's just say, 119.50. So we'll have to see if something like that happens. But the moment to get into this trade would have been in the PRZ, which was, uh, let's see here. I believe it went a little bit higher. 
um, just looking, looking at my other screen here, but it was somewhere around this area between uh, 118.75 and 118.90 was the bottom of it, and it stretched all the way up. So this would have been your, your moment of high probability where you could look for price to come back and obviously, hopefully, come down all the way to about 117. So it, it has a ways to go, and it does, and it is probably going to take some time for it to come back. Um, but one of the things that you can do is with 30 bar rule um, that we had is to measure from your X point all the way to your D point to see how many candlesticks that is. And it usually takes on average about a third of those candlesticks for the pattern to actually work out to the B point. So you can kind of conveniently, conveniently find out how long you could be in a trade for um, based off of that alone, just using the one third rule of how many candlesticks were made between X and D to kind of get you in. So see, we just had a new alert fire off with a 70%. Um, let's see here. Where would you set your targets if you took uh, the trade? Well, if I was to take this trade, I'd probably set my target, my first target, to whatever uh, my risk was doubled. So if I had entered, uh, let's just say, uh, in the middle of the PRZ, we'll use that as a hypothetical area. Okay, 119.05, and I wanted to put my stop outside of the PRZ, which would have been, say, around 119.40, you know, give it a little bit of room. Uh, then we'd be looking at, at about 35 pips of risk, which means my first target is going to be when I'm up 70 pips, right? So I'm looking for 70, I'm looking for 70. My first target would be around 118.32. Otherwise, what's going to happen is the last point I move my stop to break even would be when my risk is equal to my reward, right? So as soon as I'm up 39 pips, my stop should be at break even. I don't want to risk anything after that. That would be almost like a worst case. There are a lot more advanced ways to move your stops, and they can be really effective. But if you wanted to use like a worst case scenario, then you know once your risk is equal to what your reward is, you definitely should have your stop at break even. And then you're looking for a move down to the two to one. Now the reason why we don't want to use one seventeen as a stop or as a as a target is because it's almost like playing the lottery, right? If you bought a ticket for five dollars and you expected to win, you know three hundred million, the chance of you winning is so slim. But in, I guess in, in the Forex and with your lottery ticket, if you bought a $5 ticket and you expected to win five bucks, your chances would go up a lot. So it's the same sort of thing when we use it with our, our patterns. You know, when we risk 39 pips and we hope to gain 200, your chance of that happening versus risking, say, 40 pips and making 80, it's going to be a lot greater, right? So we always want to hit that first target. Now, we can go into a whole nother topic on you know, um, scaling out or scaling into the trade, but you essentially don't want to take your, your profit at one entire level. You want to break it up and you want to take it preferably at three different levels. So the two to one would just be your first sort of area that you could be looking at getting a target. But it's a good question, Sandy, because a lot of times people might look at the B point and go, okay, well, that's where I want my first target to be, but it's not, um, likely to be hit as much as it is the two to one. So keep that two to one because then you only have to be that 33% correct, right? Or a third right before you actually get above that water point and you actually, the, the water line and you can break your trade up and that way, you know, you can almost get into the territory of building up your account without having to, to risk a ton. So yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be much more achievable to hit 118 before, you know, we, we get down to 117, 117 and a half. Boyke, have you traded these patterns before? No, when I place a trade, look, when I, I personally think, and again, it's just my personal opinion that people are always looking at the wrong thing a lot of the times when we get a lot of new traders into the room. Um, you know, they're they're more focused on their entry point. I'm more focused on my stop. I want to know where I can get out and be okay and satisfied 
that I got stopped out. I don't want to get stopped out and then wonder, should I have gotten into that trade? Um, you know, or should I get back into the trade? I want to know a, a good point at where my, my idea has been broken and I can be happy taking that stop. And that stop should always be twice as small as what my risk is or else I won't take it. So I'll never bail out of the trade because if I get hit with a stop, if, if I get taken out of the trade, my idea is broken. I want to find out if the idea is broken. There are, though, very few situations where you might bail out of a trade. Okay, so one might be just before the weekend. Okay, if you're going into the weekend and you have a, a, a 30 pip stop and you're kind of around that break even mark, or maybe you're 10 pips under and you don't want to hold it over the weekend because there's a G20 meeting, you know what I mean, and, and you believe it's in a gap then it would make sense to, to pull that trade. But never during the week where, you know, I expect the market to, to move or, or to do something, I'll, I'd rather get stopped out than to bail out of that trade and just know I'm wrong. So when I commit to the trade, I'm committed to it. Um, it's either going to um, work out or it's going to fail. Like, I'm not afraid of these trades hitting its stop. Right, because if if I take um, I don't know four trades in a row that stop out, and then I get four trades that win, if my profits are always going to be double what my risk is, then I have a, a probable way of of making money. Right. Well, actually, you know what? I wouldn't say they're subjective at all. Um, I I would say that these these patterns of anything, because there's so many ratios and rules kind of surrounding them. It's a very good way to keep traders consistent, right? And I think that is more of where the the sub, uh, I guess the the subjectiveness kind of comes in, is you know people don't have a methodology that keeps them consistent, so they don't get their consistent results out of it because they're not acting consistently. Where when you use something like harmonics and, and you have these ratios and they're pretty tight and you have you know some basic rules like you want your risk or your reward to be double as your risk, you, you know, you're, you're going to have, you know, at least 30 bars in a pattern. They're very um, decisive sort of ways to filter out which patterns you're going to be trading, which ones you're not. Um, like there's guys in the room that will only trade crab patterns and they will, you know, maybe aim for a five to one risk versus reward. And what will happen is they'll lose a lot more trades than what they win. They might lose, let's just say 60% of their trades, but their winners are going to be five times what their losses are. So they really don't care. Then there's going to be other people who love to trade Gartley's. Um, or bat patterns that you know might have a lower risk versus reward, and they're going to experience more winners than losses. But their winners are maybe only going to be double um, what their losses are going to be. So it can be something that can be tailored to a lot of different people, and I think that's why a lot of people kind of like it, is because there's a lot of rules around it. Uh, what percentage are the patterns successful? Uh, well, <laughs> you got to define the sex. Success. So what we've done is when we look at um, there's a if you go to fxgrammarks.com, we have a live stats page. So all the all of the stats are taken off of what goes into our database, which are taken off of our structure rating. Um, I'll give you an example. During last year, um, I had a, an average uh, risk reward of about 2.7 and I was right 62 percent of the time. So I don't know if that kind of gives you an idea, but I'm, I was almost closer to three to one and I was about 62. So it really depends what you are trading, right? If you wanted to have a bigger risk versus reward, your, your win percentage is going to go down. If you had a win percentage of about 1.5 and you took high structured patterns, then your win ratio is going to go up to, to say 65, 70, maybe 75 at times during, you know, certain months um, when certain pairs could be really harmonic. Um, so yeah, but it's not going to be something like where you, you know, you get 80% winners or 90% winners. You can have 80 or even 90% uh, reversal rates, but not um, where it hits your target, right? So if, if you had, if you were looking for a 15% reversal rate, you can be upward towards that 80%. Um, but if you're looking for actually hitting a target, you're going to be much lower probably if you stick that that two to one between 65 70 percent but really all you need is to get over that 33 percent with a two to one risk versus reward
And that's why like money management is, um, I'll, I'll find an article and, uh, I'll send it to you guys later. Or if you want to send me an email here, I'll give you my email. Cause I don't think I, I typed it to you guys before. Um, I'll send you an article on it, but, uh, the strategy is only really one part of what you guys do or what you need to know, right? The strategy is one aspect of it. Uh, the other part, of course, is money management. And then the third part is your psychology. And if you if you have the strategy down, but you don't have the money management or the psychology part of it, you're never going to get to where you want to go, right? If you have the psychology part, but you don't have the strategy or money management, you're screwed as well. So as long as you have all three of those and you don't ignore one, you should be, you know, um, a lot better off than other otherwise, right? When you observe these patterns, you take into account support and resistance. I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, I know other people that don't. I will tell you, though, that there is an impact on, on not necessarily your results, but how you get there. So, for example, um, smaller time frames, you'll get more winners in a row but you will also get more losers in a row when you don't use support resistance. If you use support resistance, you'll probably break up those winners and losers a lot more than if you ignored it, right? Um, so that's one of the things that there's a key little difference there between a 15-minute and let's just say a, a four-hour pattern um, where you might be using support resistance. So just remember that, you know, smaller term time frames, you know, more winners, more losers in a row, depends what you like. Um, but you also get that same sort of outcome if you use support or resistance or not. And there's no difference, like how you trade these patterns on a one hour versus a 15 minute on a daily. I mean, you can give me a stock chart, you can give me a futures contract. It's all going to be traded the same way. In fact, remove all the details from the chart, you know, show me a chart and I'll tell you if I want to trade it. I, it really doesn't matter to me. It's just more of a, a of a pattern. And if I can meet that risk versus reward, and if I can, you know, have that 30 bars and good structure, then I know that that's something I want to be in. Even if it's like a, a weekly chart, you know, or, or a 30 minute, I mean, it really depends on what sort of uh, time you have, right? Because if you trade a 15 minute, you'll probably have to hang around your computer more. If you want some freedom and you want to trade a four hour, it could take two, three, four days to work out. Um, but it's all going to be traded the exact same way. But good questions. I didn't want to hit off a lot of the, the nitty gritty on the ratios because I think it's very boring. Um, but if you guys want to go over that one day, let FX Street know. We can definitely do a session on that. There's a lot you can learn with the pattern points and the ratios, and there's a lot of shortcuts you can do. Um, so if you want to map them out manually, it makes it very easy. Otherwise, we do have indicators and whatnot that can kind of help you with that. Um, so yeah, it's totally up to you on what you guys want to do. But there are three issues of the harmonic mag, so I, I encourage you guys to read those. Um, if you, let's see, where are they? Yeah, here's the link. You, you can go there and you can just grab them. Um, if they get emailed to you and, uh, if you have any questions, John's contact information is forwarded to you and you can always ask him, um, or you have my email as well. I think I posted it already. There you go. So you guys have any other questions on this sort of opening uh, to harmonics or, or how we go about using them? Um, by all means, let me know. And uh, we can definitely help you guys out with that. I think that's probably it. I don't want to overstep my time. I don't actually know how much time I had. Um, <laughs> I kind of did this last minute when, when Derek's computer kind of went poof. Um, but hopefully, um, hopefully you guys learned something. 
Uh, time frames, the best ones, I mean, it really depends how much time you have available. It's usually more of a personal thing. When you get into, though, the five minute, the one minute, um, the 15 even, you really got to look at your spreads because your spreads can impact your risk versus reward, and you might not want to take that trade. So that's another thing when you select your time frames you might want to look at. You always have to maintain that risk versus reward. You got to keep that as one of your, your primary sort of filtering factors with the patterns. Um, so there, there's not any time frame that shows us a difference, um, but we do have a, a study. If you look on our blog, um, we took 250,000 patterns and we broke it down for every time frame and every pattern. So if you want to see something like that, and if you can't find it, shoot me an email, I'll send it to you and we'll get you all, all hooked up with that stuff. But um, you'll see that there's very little difference based off the, the time frame, and it's more to do with um, the, the, the spreads. And that's what will stop you. So if you look at a Gartley pattern, uh, you can you can imagine you'll have a lower risk versus reward because the D point is very close to the B point, and that's you know when your spread could be affected. So I'm not sure I understand where is he as soft then. Maybe you can rephrase it. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I don't know where he is. I, I know his computer is like, uh, had some problems. That's all I, I really got told. He, he had called me uh, just beforehand. Yeah, you can put in sell and buy limits. Um, you, you can, uh, you know, obviously you want to be aware before a news event that you don't have pending orders in there in case price decides to fly up. It's usually a good idea to wait for the PRZ to be tested a little bit uh, before you hop into it. So you don't get into it the second the PRZ gets formed, um, but just to kind of wait for, for price action and settle down a bit, especially before a news event. But yeah, I mean, you can put pending orders in. I mean, I most of my orders are market orders. Um, but if I go to bed and, and I want to get into a big four hour pattern, then for sure I'll use I'll use limits. And look, if you don't have a lot of time where you can you can spend it in front of the computer, then absolutely. I mean you can put your limits in, your stops, and it's probably a little bit better if if you had that uh if you had that, but yes, base of Toronto. Are you up in this neck of the woods? Oh, send me an email if you are. We can grab beer. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to get off here. Let FX Street have the room back. I'll figure out the mic, hopefully, for next time, and uh, we'll get Derek's computer all connected. All right, guys. All the best. Cheers.